good evening. Uh, I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to be invited to a JavaScript meetup. And uh, I prepared a JS edition of my talk and demonstration of Azure Functions, which is a technology I use a lot recently, and I like it. I would even say I love it, even though it's a technology, so how do you love a technology? Anyway, without further ado, I'm Martin, I'm from Prague, from the Czech Republic. So I finally happened to be a foreign speaker uh, at an event. I've been with Microsoft for five years now, always in a technical position, so I actively try to avoid doing business, dealing with money, dealing with marketing. So I was a consultant, then I was a technical evangelist, and now we're shifting to something which we call a software engineer, which doesn't mean that I work on Excel or Outlook or Visual Studio even. I don't do products. I work with partners and customers. So what do we do with me and my colleagues around the world? We're in the global team, and we actually start new projects new innovative projects with our customers and partners, and then we let them continue along. And we also publish what we found out. So I would say 80 or 90% of my work is open source. Even this talk and all the demos are on GitHub. The presentation is on my blog. So everything I do, I publish. And besides that, I'm a podcaster, I'm a geocacher, I'm a gamer, I'm a reader, and uh, there's no sports, I'm, I'm, I'm a developer, so I don't do sports. <laughs> anyway, get to the topic, serverless. I believe you've heard of this. Does anyone think that there are no servers in serverless? One guy, two people. I'm sorry to break it for you, there are still servers in serverless. You just don't care about them. And it's nothing new, it's actually, we used to call it platform as a service, you may remember that. And now it's serverless. If you provision a database in the cloud, that's platform as a service, and it's also serverless, because you don't care about the servers, you just consume it. If you provision storage in uh, at Microsoft Cloud, Amazon Cloud, whatever, it's still serverless, there are no servers, even though there are actually actual servers there. <laughs> but you don't care about them. The difference I see when we talk about serverless and the difference for me is that I can take my own code and make it run on the serverless infrastructure. When I have a SQL database, I don't run my code in there. It's the SQL code. Actually, if you consider SQL queries uh, as your code, you, you can say that you run your code. Never mind. When I have storage, there's none of my code. But when I have a JavaScript function and I want to run it on a serverless hosting, that's something I like to uh, think about, serverless. And then it scales. It scales automatically. You, if you remember old days of provisioning new servers, it actually meant buying a server, moving it somewhere, connecting it to electricity, install operating system, and then deploy your app. Then you move to the cloud. So you, pro you provision a server in the cloud, but you still have to decide. Do I need two cores, three cores, how much memory, uh, how much bandwidth, how many instances? Is one enough? Two, three, four? Oh, that's, that's expensive. When you work with serverless, you don't care about this. It should scale transparently, and you should pay per execution, not per time it is running. And that's all in Azure Functions, actually. <laughs> so what is it? Azure Functions is a backend technology. It's a nice transition from the front-end part we had uh, earlier. And it allows you to just run your code and have it triggered by various bindings. And I'll get to that in much more detail. It also scales on demand, so if it runs I would say once per day or twice per day. You just need one instance and that would be it. And you pay for those two executions. If it runs a hundred million times per an hour and then it doesn't, it again scales automatically 
provisions the servers for you and then kills them. What you pay for is that 100 million executions, not the servers running. And how can it be run? It can be run by different triggers. Uh, we call them bindings because they doesn't need necessarily have to be triggers. It can be output and uh, input as well. So, for example, you have a file. You upload it to blob storage, which is our storage for files in Azure. The function gets triggered. You can also use files from the storage as inputs, and you can also save something to storage as an output. And it's very easy. I will show you how it works, actually. Another binding uh, very frequent is HTTP. This makes the function work uh, as an API. It just has a URL, you call it, you put some data into it, and it works. And it returns, actually. Uh, these don't return. Blob storage trigger doesn't return anything. It's completely asynchronous. Mm, very popular is Q binding. Yeah, and that's actually how you communicate between functions. You shouldn't call one function directly from another. You should put a message to a queue and let the other function pick up its message and then process it. <coughs> very popular is timer and very interesting is Twilio binding. This is a specific vendor locked binding which allows you to send uh, text messages, SMS. It's uh, Twilio is a service to send uh, text messages. And this whole thing is also connectable to the whole uh, Azure ecosystem. So if you have uh, special services in Azure, you can trigger those from functions, but I will not be going into that. So a few practical examples. Example number one, time and trigger. You can set a function which is run, let's say, every five minutes, or once per day, or once per month. You use the cron expression, it looks like this. I'm not sure about you, but I still struggle with this. I never understand. It's so difficult to, to, def to define. What does this mean? And what is this? Can, you, can someone tell me what this means? Just by looking at it? Every five minutes. Perfect. Every zero second, actually, each uh, fifth minute. So let's see how this would be built using Azure Functions. <clears throat> it's called Azure Functions, but I want to do the whole thing locally on my PC. So this is Visual Studio Code. I believe you're familiar with it. Do you, do you know Visual Studio Code? Is there anyone who's using it for production, for their daily work? Perfect. So, what I could do is to go to the terminal and just do func, func, and I could work with functions from that. What I've done extra is I've installed Azure Functions extension for Visual Studio Code so that I can do something like functions create new project and then go through uh, sort of a wizard so that I don't have to remember everything. I didn't want to torture you, so I've done that already. And I've built a simple function which is called by <coughs> timer. And to make it uh, faster and simpler, it will be called every 30 seconds. Actually, it will be called in 0 and then 30th second, and then 0 and 30th second uh, every minute. So twice a minute. <laughs> and it's a trigger. And then there's a definition of an output. An output will be a table. And when we say table, we mean storage table in Azure. <laughs> and the table will be called meetups and directions so. so this is function JSON. This is the definition of bindings. And the code itself, and even though I'm a .NET developer, I took the challenge and I rewrote a bunch of my functions to Node.js, JavaScript. So this is my try on JavaScript. <laughs> You see that I'm not in the async await path yet, but I'm getting there. I maybe get a detour to TypeScript first, but still. <laughs> promises better than callbacks. And so what this function does is using the meetup.com API to 
to download upcoming events in this area. If you're from here, you probably recognize this area. This is Budapest. <laughs> Budapest, as we call it, from. And uh, once uh, the information is downloaded, it's a JSON object, quite big. Uh, we just parse it, we take the events, and for each of those events, we build something which I call table route. And this is something that will be written to the storage table. It does have, it needs to have a partition key, it needs to have a row key. These are two mandatory properties of each entity in the storage table. This is basically the primary key. So I just built something. And then I put those properties of each of the events from Meta. So this builds the whole object as a JavaScript object. And then I do this, and this is it. I just push to the table. Every time I call push to the output table binding, it will send, save the route to the table. I don't have to connect to it, because that's already set up. And then I say context done, which tells the function that it's, it's done, it can finish. So now I could do something like func host run. But I'm in Visual Studio Code, so what I do, I press F5. And wait for it. The tooling is running, and it even tells me that it will be run in, in a few seconds. Wait for it. It has started, it has triggered, it has downloaded the data, and if I refresh the tables, there's the meetup table. It wasn't there before, it created it. And these are the meetups which are upcoming. Too bad this meetup is not there anymore because it's already running. When I tried it before, it was there and the demo was much nicer. <laughs> and so these are the properties. If you're interested in how the storage function, uh, the storage tables work, this isn't, this isn't actually a table, it's actually a key value store. So it can have uh, any columns you like, it's, it's a NoSQL database in a different form. And it, it has run again, so if I'm not mistaken, yeah, there are duplicates now. Because it's not that sophisticated yet. So this is the time trigger. I always imagine myself like this. It never works because you can't read anything on, on the glass. Uh, another example. Let's imagine, and we've actually done this uh, on a hackathon. You have uh, 100,000 files, images, you want to download for a catalog of products. And you want to store them into, into Azure storage. What do you do? Well, you make a function for it, of course. So. The input in this case is a file. It can be a CSV file, it can be, we actually used a JSON a text file. Each line represented one image. So you upload it to Blob Storage. Once the file is uploaded, first function gets triggered. It's a Blob trigger, so it's waiting for the file to get there. Once this is triggered, it parses all the lines, 100,000 lines, and for each of the lines, it sends a, sends a message to a queue. So now we have 100,000 messages in a queue. There's another function which is listening to this queue and starts picking the messages one by one. When I run it on my computer, it will be really one function. When you run it in the cloud, it will see, oh, we have now 100,000 uh, messages in the queue. What are we going to do? One instance is not going to cut it. So it will aggressively scale up. It will just add more instances to be able to process it as fast as possible. This is actually what you, you can read in the documentation, as fast as possible. Does it mean in 5 seconds, in 10 seconds? We don't know. It will be as fast as possible. That's how the cloud works. So let me show you the implementation. It will be more complex, I promise, but not that much more. So this is the file. 
Uh, it's uh, for simplicity, I just uh, picked a few images from my blog and uh, assigned the names to them, to just make it very easy. And then I have two functions. First is called start download, and the second is download. So you may guess what start download does. It's the block trigger one, it waits for a new file in the source container. So there's a container which is called source, and every file which gets uploaded to this uh, container is picked up by this function, and the function reads the name of the file and assigns it automatically to a property or a variable or a parameter. And then we set up uh, an output, direction is out, and it's queue, so it'll be a queue called downloads. We used to have a table, now we have a queue. It's very simple. And what it does is a very sophisticated algorithm to parse the file of 100,000 lines. So it just splits it. And again, context, bindings, out queue, this is the name I've set. And push is the same principle as with the table. On each push, a new message gets added to the queue. And of course, the downloader is waiting on a queue, no surprise, and it has an output. And it outputs to another container called downloaded with the specific name. And this is, this is so simple that I'm even afraid to, to describe it. But I'll, I'll do it anyway. <laughs> this is it. This is the whole thing. We get the file as a JavaScript object. We take the URL. This is just logging. So what we do? We take the URL, download it, and then set it to the output block. That's it. If I wouldn't use the functions runtime, which does all the work for me, I would have to pick the message from the queue, uh, read the message somehow, uh, say, send to the queue that I've accepted the message. Then I would have to build a client for, for the blob, uh, for the blob container. I would have to send the file there, upload it, and then close, close the function. So it will be like eight, nine lines of code. It is one. So I can focus on what's important, and that's downloading the file, which actually, I'm ashamed to admit it, but it was a pain to do, to do it properly, because I'm not sure if you're familiar with this, but it this has to be there for some reason. Mm. So let's run it. Oh, and I'm in Visual Studio, <coughs> so I can do the buggy. So, source. I've already uploaded the file, so I will do a little trick. I will change metadata of the file. And that will trick the Azure Functions runtime into thinking that the file is new. And after a few seconds, we should see picking up, downloading, and we are stopped on the breakpoint, which is correct. So now we're downloading which one? Free JPEG. Continue. It's downloaded, and in the downloaded container, these are the images. Yay! I used three. If you use the million, it doesn't really matter. The problem, actually, <laughs> we we bumped into a problem when we were running this on a uh, hundred thousand images, and that was the other server <laughs> because they thought they were DDoS, and they just blocked us. And that's solvable, because there's this nice file in definition of the function. It's called host.json, and here you can set, for example, a throttling. So you can say that we will, be a, we will process most, at most 30 messages uh, from the queue at once. So that will make it a little slower and a little more consumable from the other API. Okay, so this is the blob trigger and blob downloader. There are other cases, I will not be showing demos for them, but this, these are real stuff, uh, real projects. Uh, this was the case for a simple backend, which would allow the manufacturer, they have a large factory, they have machines, and each of the machines 
have something like three buttons attached to them, and they press the buttons if they need something. It can be a need of service, it can be a need of... Uh, I don't even know what, what that is. Something else. What happens is that the message from the button goes to IoT Hub, which is a service in Azure to, connect, to communicate with IoT devices and get messages from them. And because IoT Hub has uh, basically a queue inside of it, we are able to listen to the queue uh, with functions, with one function actually, and then use the same principle, the same binding, but Twilio, and based on the information from a table, I didn't put the table in here, uh, I actually had to download, get a phone number of a person who's responsible for the specific message. So I downloaded the number and I sent the text message. Very simple. Uh, without much configuration on the Twilio part. This is more complex, and I have actually a demo prepared for this, but I don't think we will have uh, time for it. Uh, but if you're very much interested, I can show it at the end, we'll see. Uh, this is a uh, backend for a self-service kiosk. You may know it, if you go to a shopping mall or to a fast food restaurant, there is a, is a large display, a touch screen display, and you, you press a button and another button and then you pay and you can order using this kiosk. You don't have to talk to a real person, which is amazing. It's not everywhere though. <laughs> and then you just pick up the, the goods. So what we are doing with one partner was that we enhance it with uh, personalized recommendations. So once you make a purchase, it asks you is it okay if I take a picture of you and remember you for next time? And if you consent, because we have the GDPR, so if you consent with this, uh, it will remember what you ordered, and next time when you come, it will offer you the same thing or any other recommendation. It really matters for, for the owner of the restaurant. It's using cognitive services and face recognition, stuff like that. You don't have to register. You don't even have to know the person. We don't know their name, we don't know their email address, we don't know their phone number, we just know their face. And that's enough. And it was a series of functions in reality. The kiosk itself was a web application. It was uploading a picture through a Node.js API to Azure Storage. And then it forgot about it. It was just, here's the photo, do whatever you like. <laughs> Actually, separately it opened a WebSocket connection, but that's it. You can do whatever you want with the kiosk. And then a series of functions took the image and looked at it. Is there a face? Yes. Do we know the person? No. Let's onboard the person. Okay, person onboarded. We don't have any recommendation yet. Do we know the person? Yes. Do we have a recommendation for the person? Yes. Here's the recommendation. And then we used server sent events to just communicate back to the kiosk and show it. This whole thing takes something like four seconds to do. So it's all asynchronous. The kiosk doesn't wait for anything. And as you can see, all the functions communicate through queues. And I've ported this to JavaScript. Yesterday it, was, it worked. <laughs> I'm not sure if I want to show it to you, but maybe we'll get to that eventually. So how do you do it? How do you work with, uh, with functions? When you're starting, when you're beginning, it might be a good, good idea to just go to the portal, to Azure portal, and just build it in the portal. It is possible, you can do it. In reality, you don't want to do it, but you can. There's the full editor for it, there's the view of the functions, and uh, actually when you save anything in the editor, it will reload the function, and you can see the results right away. What's great about this is there's a visual editor for the bindings. Because if you don't know what you're doing, it's usually good to have a guide to help you with it. So you can here you can set, you want a blob, which blob, which container, what is the connection string, it's, it's all in here. Once you know how this works, it's very easy to just move to the function JSON and just type it in. So that's one way. When you start doing the real thing, when you start going to production, you usually want to do it locally. You want to develop on your PC and you want to use other people to help you with it. Because you work in teams, right? So 
you can install this npm package Azure Functions for Tools to have everything running locally. You can actually install this package on a server. I'm not sure why would you do that, because then you, you would lose the, the power of the cloud, but you could do it. You could run it on your own server and uh, make it the whole runtime available to you. What I emphasized here is uh, the difference between the two versions. This is not the latest version. The latest version is 1.0.10. For some reason, it doesn't work. There's some bug in it. So I just give you a heads up. Downgrade the tools if you, if you have the latest version or use this version directly. Or if you work on a Mac, if you work on a Linux machine, you can use version 2, V2, which is using .NET Core. So it's cross-platform. Because initially, the v button is only for Windows. It's using .NET Framework for historical reasons. So now they're preparing v2. It's not in production yet, but it's available. And you can use that uh, on any machine, not, not only Windows machine. And then you would do something like funk in it, name. Then don't forget to cd into the folder like I did. And funk new language, choose, trigger, uh, choose template, name it and stopped. And it's, it's quite nice. You feel like a real hacker when you do it. <laughs> then you want to do something real, so you start using tools, IDEs. You can use Visual Studio Code, you can use any other IDE because it's all open source, it's all available to connect. And as I said, I use the extension, so I can do something like functions, create new project. Okay, create a function. Then, where do you want to create a function? What is the template? So here are the, the most common triggers. Okay, uh, what's the name? And then you can either start it from, uh, from the command line or you can just uh, use the debugger and you've seen all this. Again, the, the difference, and it can be confusing, between v1 and v2 is mostly the cross platforminess v2 is cross platform, v1 is not. Both are open source. So how do you host it? Again, two options. <coughs> App service plan and consumption plan. App service plan means that you pick a server and you host it as a regular web application. If you have a Node.js app and you deploy it to Azure, you would probably do it on App service plan. Consumption plan is specific for functions. And that's the serverless serverless, the raw serverless serverless. Serverless, serverless. App service plan is paid 24-7. When it's existing, when it's running, you pay for it. No matter if you call it or not. No matter if it's running or not. You just pay for it all the time. It has its benefits. For example, you can turn always on. Always on means that even though your function is not run for half an hour, it's still alive. It's still hot. Because uh, at the back end, it's using IIS. And IIS has this uh, tendency to kill applications if they are not alive for a while. It's not a big problem. It can be a problem with if you have a slow cold start. If your application is using many node modules, for example, if you have 100,000 files, it can bring a cold start to the app and it can be beneficial to have always on. On. Otherwise, it doesn't make much sense. And it's also predictable. You know that you pay $20 per month and you will pay those $20 all the time. You will pay them next month and the next and the next. This is not the case with the consumption plan where you pay per execution. So if you have a steady workload, if you know how many users you have, how many calls you have on the function, if it's not once per month but it's once per second, for example, makes sense to use the app service plan. Otherwise, go with the consumption plan. I use it for everything. True is, I don't do production workloads, but still, I use it for everything I do. Because you pay per execution and consume memory if your, if your function is, is run twice, but it cons consumes 10 gigabytes of memory, you will pay more for it. The problem can be the cold starting, I mentioned that. There's a solution for it. 
so I'll show it uh, as well. And uh, estimating the cost of memory and timing it, it runs. And finally, how does it perform? I said it scales automatically. You don't care about the scale, and it's the cloud, the big cloud. So how does the cloud perform? Uh, we had a partner, and they wanted to host uh, invisible pixel on, on websites. And the question was, how do we host it? And we said, as your functions. And they said, does it hold 100 requests per second, uh, 1,000 requests per second? And we said, we don't know. So we tried it. So I run load tests. I put uh, something like, it's not visible here, but that the top is 20,000 concurrent users. And I ran it for 20 minutes. And this is the result for consumption plan. It was able to hold that uh, 1,000 RPS uh, with a few fails. But what you can see here is uh, where when the auto scale kicked in. This is actually the requests per second, and these are the users. This is the user count. And this is where it aggressively scaled up because it, it noticed that after four or five minutes, something's going on. So we, they added more servers, and then it was uh, going back down. Average response time was eight seconds. Not so good, not bad either. Other tests I've tried were running anywhere between 80, 90 seconds, even timeouts. So then, to compare, I tried the most expensive uh, app service plan we had, or we had at that time. And that was the P3, premium 3, with 20 instances. Oh, and this was 35 servers at, at the top, at the peak. So I used 20 servers, 20 instances. I think it was better. It, uh, the average was 1400 RPS, with maximum of 2000. And uh, the response was 0.63. But that's kind of obvious because this, this is the beast. This is the most you can, almost the most you can get from app service plan. So at the end, consumption plan is not that bad uh, doing performance. In reality, in practice, in production, if I had such work, such uh, load for an hour or two or three, I wouldn't choose consumption plan. It just doesn't make sense. If it was just a spike, like that for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, the consumption plan is perfect for it. How to do even more? How to do something like mega scale? 100,000 requests per second. The functions team tried that. They ran, ran their own, own load tests and they were able to do it by using Event Hub as uh, the trigger. Event Hub is uh, another service in Azure, it's basically a queue. So they were putting requests to this queue and they were processing them. This is HTTP, so you have to process each of the requests separately. But this is not HTTP, it's a queue. So you can batch those, uh, uh, those requests. So they batched those requests, so they got rid of the overhead, because each separate run of the function has some overhead around it. So they took, I don't know how many, thousand, uh, messages per one run, and they were able to do 100,000 RPS. If you're interested in that, there's a link in the presentation I will put uh, somewhere online. Another learnings, don't use the same storage account. If you can, just avoid storage at all. If I, when I run my tests without any storage, I got a performance boost by 100%. So I went to 2,000 RPS on consumption plan just by getting rid of the storage. It doesn't mean that it's slow. The fruit boot of storage is 20,000 RPS, but in combination with load and everything, it just was slowing things down. Now something specific about Node.js. It's the cold start. Basically, that's the biggest pain everyone bumps into when they start with app service, which is functions, and Node.js. You can see that if you have many Node modules, the cold start can take, can take very long. It's 89 seconds, 84 seconds. 
but the consecutive, the second call is 47 milliseconds and 48 milliseconds. That's because how app service and Azure functions work behind. What they do is they have a special storage for your code. And when a new server is provisioned, and when the function is not running for a half an hour, it means that the new server has to be provisioned for it. We just take all, all of your files, the whole code, and copy it to the server. It's fast, because it's all basically on the same network, but when you have 100,000 files in node modules, it can take some time, something like 80 seconds. It's not that much of a big deal with .NET, because there are not that many files, but still, it can take some time. We have the same problem with PHP. Uh, so there are efforts to eliminate this, and it's called run from zip. This functionality is in preview, but you can try it. And it basically works like that. You zip your whole application as a zip file, as a one file. You put it somewhere on the internet. Uh, the best way, the best uh, place to put it is actually Azure Storage, because it runs, it's in the same data center, so it will be fast. And then functions are run from this zip file. They mount the zip file as a read-only file system. So they don't copy anything anywhere. They just mount the whole file and run from that file. And that solves this problem. Another solution which came before this is called Funkpack. And it uses web Webpack to actually bundle all, all your node modules into one file. And then you copy this one file or a uh, uh, low amount of file, not that 100,000 different uh, JavaScript files and other files. So this, this works as well if you have this problem. And again, you need to have many, many node modules in your application. If you're using 10 or 20 or 50, it's not that much of a big deal. But if you're, if you're file system tree goes very, very deep, you might bump into this. And finally, a few recommendations. Functions should be small. You saw my functions. Five lines of code, no more. It should do one thing, and it should do it fast. If you can, if you're able, and if it makes sense, to just uh, take your big application and chunk it into smaller pieces, do it, because then each of the pieces scales independently. I don't need 20 servers to download one file from storage. I need 20 servers to download 100,000 files from various web servers. And these two parts scale independently. It's always good to respond fast. If you're using HTTP trigger, it's good to just take the request, store a message to queue, and respond immediately and let the rest work uh, on its own. Our kiosk function was taking four seconds. If the kiosk was waiting for it, it would kill the experience. It would just kill the user interface. So we made it completely asynchronous. Uh, use queues, don't call functions directly, and count with the fact that all the functions and the functionality is stateless and should be stateless. So use Redis, use uh, storage for I don't know, for information you need to share between instances. But the, the functions themselves should be stateless because they are just being killed and spun up as, uh, as it comes. And you never know on which server it would run. And actually, it's kind of a surprising recommendation, but I, I put it here anyway. Use docs, use the documentation. It's really good. There are things, a few things missing. And we work hard to, to fill them. But still, Microsoft has moved to docsmicrosoft.com. This whole thing is open source. The whole uh, documentation which is running on, on this website, on this server domain, is on GitHub. So if you're missing something, file an issue, or even better, do a pull request and just fix it. And uh, functions documentation is good in terms of describing the various triggers and outputs and inputs, even with samples for JavaScript, for C-sharp, for F-sharp. And I 
Actually, when I was rewriting my function from C sharp to Node.js, I had it open all the time. It was actually on my second monitor all the time. And it works. Uh, if you're interested in what I've shown today, this is uh, my GitHub. This is where you will you can find uh, the source code. There's not much in it yet, it's the two functions, but I plan to make it a little bigger. And also there's a link to the presentation. Uh, I've done a similar talk uh, on a different conference, so it's sort of basically the same links. You can find it there. Do you have any questions? Yes. Thanks for your talk. I think it was really interesting. Um, but I want to ask if you have a trigger, for example, based on HTTP, um, does Azure automatically scale it over geolocation? Uh, not out of the box, not function. Should I repeat the question? Or <laughs> the question was if there was if there is a HTTP trigger, does it? Uh, Move it uh, to a different geolocation, or does it move it to a different server based on the geography of, of the source? Not by uh, by itself. There are other services which are serving as a let's say geo load balancer. So you would use this as your endpoint address, and then it will just route it automatically. It's called Traffic Manager, and it does exactly that. So people from America will get into the U.S. instance. People from Europe to the European. Yes. Do you have a free plan? If we have a free plan. Try it some. Yes. You can I think you can even try it without registration for, for an hour or so. Mm -hmm. But that's I didn't mention it, but that's one of the very nice things. And that's uh, uh, functions pricing. And yes, I'm using Google. <laughs> 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 so this is what you get for free. You get a million executions per month and 40, 400 thousand gigabyte seconds for free. And then it's, it's this cheap. If you do you know Troy Hunt, the guy who does security, have I been pawned? His website runs on functions, and he's described it on his blog, and he doesn't pay anything for it. He's using Cloudflare, that's a different story, so most of it is cached. But the rest, the, the unique calls to these APIs are for free, because it's under a million executions. And if you just play with it, even with some lighter production, you will get under a million executions easily. And then you pay 20 cents per million executions. <laughs> and those gigabyte seconds, that's a little tricky or confusing. It means it combines how long it takes to finish for the function, where not the, the boot, the load, but uh, when it enters your code, then your code is running and then it ends. So that's what's counted. And then they count the executed memory the server is using. And it can be something like 100 or 120 megabytes or more, depending what you do with uh, uh, with the code. And then if they combine it, and that's the price, that, that's the meter. Yes? Is there a cost associated with the queues? Cost associated with the queues? There is, because it's, it's a separate service, so you pay I'm not sure for what exactly, if it's the number of messages, probably, for the data. <coughs> Let's see. Pricing is uh, here. We have block storage. Or maybe queues. Queues, here we go. Come on, internet, work with me. No, this is not it. Where is it? 
operations, operations, yeah, this is it. Uh, 10,000 operations will cost something like nothing, nothing, nothing for dollars. LRS means that it's local redundant, which means that it's in a single data center, in a single building. If you use something more like uh, resilient, which is uh, geo redundant, means that everything you store in storage is in three copies in one building and in another three copies in a second data center which should be at least 700 kilometers away. So in Europe, there are more in Europe now. There are two in England, one in Netherlands and one in Ireland. So it's not expensive. How are we on time? Oh, you have a question. Can we see the kiosk demo? I was just about to ask. <laughs> <laughs> if, if I'm not sure whether really go wants to throw us out already. Tomasz, do you want to throw us out already? Yeah. Okay. Not, so we have time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's use the crowd. Who wants to see the, the kiosk demo? And I won't be offended if you do. Okay, I'll do it. <laughs> let's see. I need to I need to run it first. <clears throat> uh, so let's go to portal. So there's uh, there are two parts to it. There's uh, some mock front end which represents the the kiosk. It's a Node.js app. Uh, nothing is special about it. Uh, resource groups. And this is not my account. <laughs> Somebody hijack your browser. <laughs> I don't use the automation tools. Yeah. Here we go. No funk. Kiosk brought no, that's it. So this is the front end. I just have to start it. So I stopped it. And now let's see. This is it. By the way, I'm not sure if you, if you're aware of that. Maybe probably you are. But uh, I once ran a Docker container listening on port 80, and I forget forgot about it, and it was open to the internet. And I connected the the next day to it, and there were like requests for my PHP admin index chip. PHP <laughs> and something like Hubsor, Xor, Epsor, or something. And there were hundreds of those requests. And I'm like, oh, what's going on on the internet? So since then, I turn everything off if I don't use it. <coughs> this is the cold start in action. So before it starts, this backend consists of one, two, three, four functions. It starts with detection of the face, then identification of the face. If the face is not identified, that means we don't know the person. It's the first time they are there. We send it to onboarding. And finally, we send a notification back to the kiosk. So let's see, the, the detection has uh, one trigger, it's a blob. It's a photo uploaded from the kiosk, and then it's using a return from the function to save a message to a queue. So this doesn't even have a name, it's just a return. And what it does, it, uh, there are some checks, and then we're using Cognitive Services SDK for Node.js. So it's creating a face API client using my key and the region, and then Again, promises, I'm sorry. It's uh, calling the detection API with the image uploaded. And if there are any faces, we put it to the queue, and that's it. If there are no faces, we don't put anything to the queue. Then identification kicks in, it's the same principle. Uh, face API client taking message from, from the queue, which is actually in this parameter. 
and there's something like detective fix ID. I will not go into details because there's more into it and even some error handling. But what happens at the end is that we send actually a message into two cubes. There are two outputs to it. First is we have identified the person. This is his. Uh, this is their ID, and it's not a new person. And then we send another message to an onboarding queue or an onboarding function. And the reason is we want to add this new face to the same person, because the way the Cognitive Services API work is that you have a person group, and in this group you have people. It's person, person, person. Each of the people have a face associated to them. So it's face, 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 face. The more faces you have, the more precise uh, the result will be. And when you send a new face, a new image of a person, it just checks the whole group and tries to find similar faces to the one you just sent. So that it can tell you, oh, is this person? Or no, we don't know this person. So that's why we do that. We just uh, say a new image to, to the existing person. And let's see how it runs. Uh, maybe finally only one thing, the notification. It, sa it sets the message to welcome and some, uh, this is their format, so we used it. And one simple recommendation. But if it's not a new person, if we know the person, we just say welcome back. And we add previous orders to, to, the, uh, to the notification and then we send it to an API. So the Node.js application running on the kiosk is actually an API for us. Let's see, good. Don't allow now, let's do it now. Kiosk ID, one, one, one. Oh, I killed it. Permissions, please, please, let me use the camera. Good. Let's see. It's not running. No. Something else is running. This is running. Kill it. This is not running. Good. Run it again. Don't be nervous. It's a demo. Yay. Let's try it again. Kind of stubborn connection, what's going on? Oh, here we go. Welcome back. Let's find a face which is new to the API. Any recommendations? No politicians, please. I don't know your politicians, so I don't want to get into that. Bill Gates. Bill Gates. <laughs> That's tricky, man. Let's do it. Bill Gates is offering hot dogs at our kiosk. So just uh, just let you see. Oh, it's already used. I will not show it to you. But this is the image. <laughs> Hi, Bill. <laughs> okay. it. Something's going on. <coughs> New user training. And welcome. We don't know you yet. When he returns, he's like, oh, this hot dog was really good. <laughs> I want another one. So let's find a different picture of Bill. Uh, okay, this one. It's different, trust me. Oh, I want to send the same hot dog as yesterday. So it took the picture, I hope.
paste text, identify new user. Oh, he did not recognize him. It's because of the of the of the fault. It's not a real text. Let's uh, try it again. One more try. It says well come back. Yeah. Sorry? It says well come back. The message. Yeah. The last message. Well come back. Oh. That's weird. Because it says welcome here. Yeah, I know. I know what's the problem with this. Actually, this is a bug. It's uh, this is running at the the Node.js uh, front end, or the the application is hosted on a Windows server, and we found out that there are some problems, issues with server sent events on Windows on Windows hosted servers, Node.js, on Node.js hosted on Windows. So if I would put it to Linux or to a Docker container would work better, but this basically means that this event is the same as uh, some some other one. But yeah, never mind. So this this is how it works. The kiosk, the actual kiosk was nicer because they had a professional design, but still, the, this is a proof that it works. Let's turn it up. Just to demonstrate it, this is the the visual editor in in the browser. Any other questions, requests? <coughs> Good. Thank you for bearing with me and my brushed JavaScript skills. And if you have any more questions or are ashamed, talk to me. Uh, in this large audience, I will be here for the next five minutes until they kick us out. So, thank you.